So welcome everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar. I uh, really appreciate your time joining uh, and listening to what the folks have got to say here today. Uh, today's topic of course is data sharing for sustainable transport uh, with the focus on working towards a greener planet with the data-driven approaches. So Without further ado, let us get in. As I say, welcome to everybody. This is being recorded. Uh, so obviously we can, after the event, we can share this out and you can get it out to your colleagues who weren't able to attend today. Uh, but I do again thank you for your time specifically for coming today live and, you know, and therefore participating in sometimes a very important part, which is the Q&A. So we have the chat. Please, please, please. I know everyone says no, they don't want to put their questions in because they'll be named and shamed, but you you really won't, I promise. So please put some questions in because we've got some great guys here, years of experience in these industries. So it'll be great to get some questions into them. And we really learn an awful lot from you because you're at the, the cutting edge of this topic. So please submit any questions in there and we can pick them up a little bit later on along the uh, this uh, webinar that we'll be having. So today, the speakers, I'll kick off a little bit, just a little bit of an introduction. My name's Michael Boyle. I head up the sales here at NACO, but I would also like to welcome David Krangle, who has joined us from the Simplicity Group and he heads up Fleet Sales. Hey there, David. And also Colm Hayden, who is today our CEO, but only of last week was our CTO, and hence why he's an ideal speaker to have here today. So again, welcome, Colm. Hi, everyone. So guys, this isn't a, a, a death by PowerPoint and, uh, you know, a, a review of everything Aneco do. Uh, we'd love to come up, obviously, and talk more about it, but a just very, very brief overview of who and what we are. So fundamentally, as I think you can pick up from that uh, slide there, we are a data engineering company and we offer consulting solutions and very importantly, teams as a service. And what we do is help customers and partners build and operate data and analytics platforms. And that's primarily our focus. We are certainly not new to transport and logistics. We've worked with fleet data management for example, things like Northern Ireland Water on their fleet reporting around the EV, of the introduction of the EV systems, Translink in the bus, the rail, vehicle, staff and, uh, staff and safety. Also in telematics cost customers working across 17,000 plus vehicles. We've worked in driverless uh, vehicle manufacturers as well. Automotive services across global dealerships, and certainly not forgetting public sector transport, data discovery, data analytics for national highways, network rail, and Department of Infrastructure that we're working on right today. So, certainly not new to this topic, but always, like everybody, learning all the time as this world that's introduced to us of sustainability. So, just to give an introduction and really a baseline setting for what David and Colin will be talking about in a moment is we all here, especially everyone here today on this call, but all of us as human beings, we care about future generations, but we also live and work today. We have revenue, we have ROI to meet today, and there's therefore there's always a balance, but with sustainability, there is also an, a, an opportunity to grow and, and create sustainability in your own business, not just about sustainability of the planet itself. If you just look at, you know, United Nations in their quote, you know, it's meeting the needs of the present. That's really important. It's not just about the future assurance. We have to create the revenue now as well, and we have to create good, sustainable business here and now. Now, to do this, of course, the government will step in and they will, with what we would call the stick, they will approach us with, and all of our businesses, with two major directives that we see today. ESG, which of course stands for Environmental, Social and Governance Directives. And what we see an awful lot more in Europe, uh, here in Ireland, where I'm uh, based right now, is more the CSRD around Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directives. And these are here and now. So these directives, which are based not just on your business, but the value chain, which is very important around data engineering, that whole mass subject, 
is 1st of January 24, more than 500 employees and so on. It's at us right now. And so it isn't about what should we do and when, it's the here and the now. And there is a great deal we can do here and now, and that's what we'll be talking about. But that's the stick. There's also the carrot. And I think the carrot is quite a large carrot. And there are a lot of incentives for businesses today. And if you look at many of the statistics out there, over 60% of consumers today buying from companies who are themselves portraying themselves as both sustainable and, and ethical. And this is increasing every single year on year of 10%. So this straight away is a great ROI story. But ESG itself, and we'll be going into this, can actually increase your operating profits by up to 60%. So we can give all of these stats and we give all the references so you can look all of these things up yourself. But a lot of companies struggle with the topic of ROI. It's one of the biggest hurdles companies are seeing. And again, we'll we'll touch into this subject a little bit as we go through uh, over this the next sort of 30, 40 minutes. So the big topic, of the major top title of sustainability is decarbonization in the transport industry. But here's where we come back to the sort of the carrot and not always beating everyone over the head with a stick is that HGVs have actually today are more efficient than they've ever been. Now, they're also trying to bring in uh, ZETs, which is zero emission transport, but it's not fully viable. And we all know that today. I mean, there's a great project in Sweden where there are dedicated lanes now running the, the length and breadth where vehicles can travel in there and be charging along the way, because that's what it's all about. Can I get to where I'm going to get to? And, and there's all of these sort of uh, blockades, you know, at the moment for the zero emission technology. But it is being adopted, massively adopted by public sector, and we see this an awful lot here in both Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. And also in the private sector, it's been adopted by the larger companies. But the reality is HGV numbers are increasing and they represent in the carbon footprint 19% of transport emissions, even though they're only 1% of the number of total number of vehicles. So you can see from the graphs, and again, we can send them out and you can expand them up yourself. But what you can see on the top graph, you can see the bottom line is showing that the trucks are becoming more and more efficient, economical. There are lots of great works going ahead by all the big truck manufacturers. But the top line is showing that carbon is actually on the rise. So the trend is a net increase in carbon. And therefore, there is a great emphasis in the transport industry, specifically in the HGV industry, to actually hone in on this and rather than just look at the efficiency of the truck, look at all of the end to end. So look at the the full providers from the start to the last mile. And that's really what in terms of what can be done today, we can actually start looking at these factors, not just be looking at the efficiency of the truck itself. So there are real actions you can take today. But these real actions are currently being perceived as challenges in m many of the industries. And the big one, the, the, the big one that everyone is citing as the main reason for sort of saying, well, what should I do next is transparency. It's getting data that you can see right across the supply chain, whether it's on emissions, which is one data point that David will be talking about in a moment, or is it about employees? Is it HR? Is it the data that comes from the HR records and sharing that across? Is it training that's needed? All of these data points and getting the transparency across your business. And so what we're looking at is a dovetailing, a sort of a phrase that's used, which is from the top down, the management down to the working staff, but also across all of the businesses. And this cross linking is really, really important to start getting the transparency across there. But also strategy itself. Are we actually creating strategies, not just tactics, but really creating a strategy that's long term with objectives that are not too modest, that actually can really push the boundaries so that you get buy in from all the different groups in the company. And that's really something that comes down to saying, well, we can if we can get a clear vision of the data 
because the data will be the source of truth which can make us make those decisions. And that's why we'll, we can link so much the idea of sustainability and data. So data-driven sustainability. What we'll see in a moment is certainly Colin will be touching on this particular point about there are many, many areas that you can be taking action on today that will not only lead to or contribute to a net carbon reduction and therefore an improved ESG rating in your reporting, but also a very clear ROI that was being cited as a major reason for challenge. Now, I'll just show this graph. And if it's OK in a moment, we're just going to pop up a little poll about uh, firstly, actually, we're going to get a little poll and I did forget. So I'm already going to get told off and a little poll about where actually all you guys are from. So we'll do that in just a moment. So just just be ready for that poll that we're just going to ping out there. But have a look at some of these tangible benefits that companies in the purple, I'm slightly colorblind, so I apologize, but we'll call it the purple left side, that companies are actually seeing today as tangible benefits. Now, you may not be able to read them all out, but the very top one is employee quality of life. And you go, well, OK, it's great that they're having a much better life, but what, how, do, how does that affect my ESG? How is that good for my uh, bottom line ROI? Well, it's actually massive because even leading to subtleties such as retention itself, churn is a major problem in many, many companies. So enabling retention is, in fact, an immediate ROI bottom line, though without question. It can improve by 10 to 15 percent. So I'll just bring that back there. So. That's just that that's the top one. But as you move down through some of these uh, points of tangible benefits, you see that areas such as actual ROI is already being seen and measurable today. The customer brand loyalty is a massive component that you're seeing as tangible benefits today. And with brand loyalty means they're not choosing to go to another vendor. Therefore, you're retaining and therefore you're increasing your ROI. So there are many, many areas already that companies today that have bought into this are seeing as benefits. But also the middle band is the same companies who are seeing it in the next one to three years? And you can see this is a large portion of companies today that are seeing these advantages of buying into ESG, not only because of the stick, but because clear carrot tangible benefits. So let me take a pause. And just before I hand over, uh, David, I just want to take a, a poll out there and just if you can, if we could push that Emma out to everyone just to see, firstly, where is everybody from? So if we could just push that out, uh, is I think the question will be with the private sector, public sector. If you could just push that out, Emma, and uh, if everyone could just fill that in. Okay. Now is that poll is that poll going out? Uh, Colm, if I could just ask you, no. Um, I'm not seeing it. That's fine. So what was oh, it? We'll, oh, we'll move on. Just one. Yeah. So we'll. Sorry, we've just got the, uh, Emma on dealing with that. So we'll we'll come to that later. So what we'll do is we'll we'll move really into the the meat of this now. I say that was just a brief introduction. So thanks for listening to this piece. And what I'd like to do now is hand over to David. And if you would, and if you'd go into your piece, and we'll get the the polls, and we'll get some. Uh, uh, sort of data from everyone who's joined today on that. So leave leave that with those guys. And uh, with further ado, hand over to David. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, can you see my slides now? We can yes. indeed. Perfect. OK, so yeah, no, thanks for that, Mike. It's a good good overview of suppose where we're at today. Um, Obviously, I work for Simplicity Group based in Ireland. Um, I'm the head of the fleet sales for Simplicity Group. Um, we work across multiple industries from government to 
transportation um, to service and industry, bus and coach. You know, we work we work across a lot of different industries, and because we're a provider of you know big data telematics to these industries, we start to hear a lot of information and a lot of feedback coming from these industries. Um, one of the big ones that suppose we're hearing right now is where do we actually start? Um, how do we do this? You know, a lot of manufacturers are, are are shouting about electric vehicles and hydrogen vehicles, and you know, and it's not as simple as a company just going out and saying, "I'm going to select this truck," or "I'm going to go out and select this van," or "I'm going to go." There's a lot of there's a lot of questions and a lot of thought and process, and has to go in and around choosing when is the right time to do this. Um, but also, where where I want to focus on today is, and what we are seeing in the industry is. Right now, there is a time where we can do something. Okay, so while we wait on the manufacturers deciding to know if they're going to go down the road of the EV or the hydrogen vehicles and bringing down the cost in the future, um, we we can do things right now. Okay, so what I want to do today is just sort of demonstrate from customer experiences and, and what we're doing and, and how people actually are pulling this information and sort of give an insight to what we've been seeing for a lot of years, but it seems now with you know the introduction of the sustainability and the CO2, people are actually really starting to look at this information a lot differently on the systems that are there. So what is the emissions of scopes for emissions for, for transport at the minute? You have three different scopes. Uh, where we typically see in the transport and logistics is most people will be into the scope three, which is the non-owned vehicles working with the likes of your pharmaceuticals, working with the like of you know your your large chains in the supermarkets as well, who are now not just having big demands on the transport and logistics that sectors based on making sure that deliveries are on time and KPIs on ETAs and making sure that deadlines are being met, but also now providing how is your vehicles doing this? You know. What is the CO2 you're producing based on doing these deliveries for us? So what we are seeing is a change in how people are now switching in how they're starting to think about the data and use the data that's coming from the systems. The approach based on the GHD protocol standards that that we see is is the approach based on the fuel based method. Um, so what that means is we connect with the fuel consumption of the vehicles. And then we're able to work out the CO2 based on vehicle type, based on you know whether it's petrol, diesel, electric, hybrid, CNG, LNG. You know, there's so many different variables now, and there's more to come. So what these what the systems are now doing is actually helping to sort of normalize and take the fear away of it's not actually that hard to get to the information today. Um, the information's there. So most of the customers that we have right now just want to be able to report on what are the actual vehicles doing? You know, what are they providing in CO2? So we do have standard reports there where we have a fuel report, opti drive reports, driver training. Now, how do I start the transition with accurate data? This is the key to the whole, you know, again, Mike alluded to it there in his opening comments where, you know, a lot of people have systems in place that are in the vehicles, but actually, how credible and how accurate is the data that's coming out of these vehicles through these systems to help in the future make the decisions and get the right information to the right hands in the time that's needed to for the finance they maybe need to do a report every 12 months so they need 12 months backwards of co2 data from the vehicles if you have the wrong technology in right now you're probably doing that via fuel cards relying on the drivers odometers trying to work all that out so what we're trying to do here is paint the picture of it's not a lot of fear around getting this information because a lot of it is already there provided by the vehicles. It's just making sure we're connected to the right vehicles with the right technology and the right information to help you going forward. So one, one of our customers in the transport and logistics sector that we would deal with very closely is the TST group based in Ballymena. Um, so I just wanted to talk into here because one of the big things they when they first spoke to us was they were very customer centric. You can see that, you know, they do uh, very customer centric and they wanted to make sure that the ETAs, the customer satisfaction piece and the compliance alongside of that was the first thing that they focused on. 
So for example, they had made, they're, they're in a period of growth at the minute. They made multiple acquisitions. They have taken over companies who had multiple different platforms. One platform gave them one set of information. The other one wasn't even given the same level of information. So what that meant for them going forward in the future was it was hard to make change because they were maybe looking at one platform and it said that a driver behavior score was you know, based on you know, a certain parameter. And then the other one was saying, well, I don't have that information, so I can't give you that score or you know, it done it in a different calculation or they were even using the manufacturing vehicles as well, which all calculate very differently. So the first approach here was to make sure that they got all the data coming in via one source. Um, and then what from there, they wanted to make sure that they were able to use that data to run multiple parts of the business, productivity, the health and safety, the compliance, to know the efficiency, um, the sustainability message, and then also making sure that it was future proofed to do what they wanted in the future in line with the growth of the business. So I have links in here anyway. There's a blog there that we, we've done with them. Um, so what did it mean bringing everything into one platform? When it comes to what we do with with companies, it's about it. It's it's also about looking at the fleet. OK, you have customers. Customers have expectations to know at different sectors. You will have to know in the government space, you will have the public to know in in the transport logistics, you'll have your customers demand and you know when's your truck going to be here. So but when you look at a planning environment in this and not just the data of the vehicles, you know, Customer customer jobs come in, they're planned, they're left at the end of the day, they're scheduled, they're sent down to the drivers. Now, in that planning phase, even from a decarbonisation point of view, there is a lot of information that can help on the day to day to know to make life a lot easier. So even from a point of view of the integration with the CAN data, so this is the vehicle side of it. So in standard telematics, you would typically have a three wire install that gives GPS information. Whereas now, you know, over the last I think 14, 15 years, we have been able to connect into the Canvas data of the vehicles. And what that means is we can pull live credible information directly from the vehicles to make more real time decisions that helps the customer ETAs. But in the background of it, it's also pulling the data that you're needing in the future for the decarbonization because it's given fuel data from the vehicles. It's pulling the live odometers. You're not relying on the drivers. It's giving you good, credible, you know, deeper driver active feedback information where you're not just saying it's a harsh braking event. You know, you're actually then starting to look at cruise control. You're starting to look at different factors that actually really affect how drivers are driving the vehicles. So what we do is every every vehicle that we ever look at you'll see down has the compatibility check we check every vehicle to make sure every vehicle can give the information that's needed for that business um, and we do that with every customer but not just the vehicles you've also now got the trailer side of it as well so a lot of people in the transport and logistics when you're planning will be saying you know what is the vehicle? We can we allocate the vehicle, allocate, sorry, allocate the trailer, but also allocate a driver. So there are the three things that are allocated to get that job done. So when you're thinking from a decarbonization side of it and you're getting the fuel data coming from the vehicle, the live driving hours, the mileage, do you know, the big win in there is actually do the jobs in less mass. Do you know, how can we plan better? How can we make the routes more efficient? In this day and age, do you know, truck specific route mapping. So instead of just having a one fits all telematics mapping system, you know, you actually have in the planning software that you have truck specific where it takes into consideration the height, the width, the length of the vehicles, the weight of the vehicles. So when planners are actually looking at these systems, they can say, I want to send this vehicle from A to B. So it's giving you exact mileage, it's taken into consideration low bridges, it's taken into consideration loads of things that planners have to think about every day. Now, what these systems are doing is actually saying, well, here's a more efficient way to do it. And in doing that, you're starting the decarbonization journey because you're planning better. The next part with the trailers here is also then looking at, there's a new legislation that's coming in this year, I think for the brake testing, where by end of June of this year, they're going to start now that it's, 
you have to start doing the, the brake testing by uh, a laden. So you have to do it with a 65% weight on the trailers. What that means is four times a year, these trailers have to be taken off the road with the truck, fully loaded, driven to a test center, taken away from jobs, adding more miles, adding more fuel to the fleet. Whereas now these new systems, what we can actually do is we can connect into these systems and we can actually provide you with the critical data where I have customers now that are moving across to the trailer management side of it and they're seeing the live loads. So empty, no empty loads, you know, trying to be full as much as possible, making the most out of the journeys. From a point of view of, you know, the maintenance side of it, they're now getting live maintenance fault codes so they can make decisions. Whereas before it's more pre, it's more sort of, instead of being reactive, it's more proactive that the garages know these, these vehicles are coming back every 12 weeks. They're able to see the live data coming from the vehicles. You know, they necessarily don't need to take it off the road because they can see the fault codes from the vehicles. Um, from a point of view of the brake testing, what that now means is with these platforms, you only have to take the vehicle off the road once a year. So if you think about, you know, four times a year, you're taking a truck and a trailer and a vehicle off the road to do a brake test. Now you only have to do that once. So it's 25% of what you were currently, what you were doing previously. So you know, there's a cost of the test. There's the cost of getting the vehicle, the driver and the load to the actual um, test centers. But what we're also now seeing is that a lot of these test centers were being passed because you could go in unloaded. Now that they're actually bringing in that the trailers have to be loaded during the test, a lot of trailers are going to start failing. So then they're going to have to go back for retests. And we have done calculations on this with customers. And actually, you know, in the reduction of the mileage, as Mike said again at the at the start of this, it's yes, we can look at decarbonization and we can say we can help reduce the mileage, improve the drivers, reduce the fuel, the CO2. So, you know, these are the quick wins that are here today that we can say be better optimized. So, you know, don't have to take the vehicles and the trailers off the road as much as what you were previously doing. Keep them on the road. You know, the businesses are then generating more revenue while also saving cost. And we had an example, we're actually in a conference now with Webfleet, and we had an example yesterday where a, fake, a fleet of 500 trailers actually figured it out and looked at the cost side of it. And what they were saying was based on putting the solutions in that actually read the data from the trailers has saved them a thousand pound per vehicle. Now, Convert that into fuel cost, CO2 savings, decarbonization. You're taking a lot of tonnage off, off the fleet there straight away. So yes, it's important to report it, but it's also important, important to show the improvements over time. So 5% per year. That's the goal. And how do we get there? So trailer load and utilization. Again, you know, you've got your trailer loads, you've all that information. The big thing here for when we looked at TST. And they brought everything into one platform. Um, for for their company, the, the number one thing was actually to start profiling the drivers. And the reason they wanted to profile the drivers was because number one, it gives them more accuracy for the customer ETAs, the better relationships. Number two, you know, it actually helps them put incentives in place to keep their drivers. So actually, their drivers are now being paid better because they're drive performing better. They're also working towards the end goal of the decarbonization message of the business, and they're aligned with the business now on the goal of we need to we need to start this decarbonizing decarbonization journey. They can't go. They could start going and buying, you know, trucks from the manufacturers, but you know we know a diesel truck today could be anywhere between one hundred and ten and one hundred and fifty thousand. You know, an electric truck you're up to two hundred and fifty three hundred thousand, and I would hate to see what a hydrogen truck's going to cost, but. Um, in this day and age, right now, today, the data tells us it's better to start with where you're at today and what you have and start making the changes with the business, with the internal processes, with you know the drivers, with the management, and really improve on that. If you think about a driver out on any given day, what telematics can now do, you know, it, it can inform your customers. You can take jobs in from customers. You can send that down to the drivers. You can provide real time ETA. You can send notifications to the customers to say the vehicles will be there at 10 o'clock, you know, which is actually realistic and it's not going to be rewritten the driver in the background because it's it's actually helping 
it's, it's truck specific, it's vehicle specific software. So what that does is it keeps the mileage down. It keeps, you know, it sorry, it keeps the mileage down on the vehicles. It keeps the mileage down for the customers, and then they're getting their CO2 reports. But the big thing here is when the drivers are being profiled, that actually, you know, there's tools there now as well. And in them tools, the systems now talk to the drivers. You know, this happens in real time. Active driver feedback. So go on the days of where you're having to sit down, bring all the drivers back to the yard, you know, sit down with them. Yes, you can have monthly, quarterly reviews. But the big thing now is that you actually have active driver feedback being fed in from the systems. So what that's actually doing is in real time, it's making change with the drivers. So with the decarbonization message right now, it's more to do with, you know, it's more to do with what do we have? What vehicle types do we have? What type of information can we get out of these vehicles? Do you know, can we transition these vehicles right now based on we know that they travel X amount of mileage, they only do X amount of work. And if you can't, well, with these ones that we can't transition and we don't have the budgets or we don't have the, you know, the if we don't have the budget, sorry, and we don't also have the necessary resource to start making the changes on them vehicles. Well, how do we work with what we have? And by working with what you have, you're also starting on that journey of improving fleet sustainability and working in line with scope three, because customers will be getting the data that they need, which in also helps the customer relationships, keeps customers happy, improves, it actually starts to add growth to the business because if you're able to provide this information quicker than another operator, then all of a sudden you're going to be looked at more favorable for future work because you're actually working in line with these new legislations that are there to know to drive this forward. It's not going away. It's going to, it's this is the way it is going forward. And it's not just looking at the big corporates, it's on the government, it's also looking at the SMEs. So from from our point of view, you know probably 70% of our base is SMEs. So when we look at them, you know, and you look at that as a, and you're maybe getting into a large pharmaceutical and they're saying, do you have this information? No, we don't. Well, you can't have this work. So that's what's in the pipeline to come. But today, what we're really saying is in the transport and logistics through the API side of it, we have planning systems, we have transport management softwares, we have telematics, we have maintenance softwares and systems, but do they all talk together? Do they actually work together for the same end goal that when you need a report on fuel at the end of the year that you're not spending a month siphoning through all the fuel data from the fuel cards, you know, or the bunkered sites or the, you know, how you currently do that fuel to find out that there's missing mileage, there's inaccuracies in how it's been done. Do you know, the odometers aren't correct, drivers haven't put the odometers in, you don't know the data. So it takes all that fear away that actually you're on in time, you're providing real time credible data. And it also ties into what we do with an echo because do you know we're providing real accurate data from the vehicles through the process while also then making the change. On a, on a lower level that making sure that we're integrating with you know the transport management systems the the maintenance systems and providing that data from the vehicles to where it needs to go so i think for me hopefully that gives a brief overview of how we can start today on the decarbonization journey um but i think from this side i'd like to hand over to colin then i think that ties in with colin for his part yeah thank thanks dave um thank you. hi everyone um, I'm going to share some slides now and, and continue on this presentation. Uh, so my name is Colm Hayden. I'm, as Mike described, the CEO at Anico, but for 18 years I've been Chief Technology Officer and we've delivered over 500 projects in all kinds of uh, uh, sustainability objectives as customers move to most sustainable platforms, um, but in particular, in the transport industry, we're speaking today with vehicle manufacturers, telematics companies, and public and private sector uh, transport operators. 
So uh, I'm going to take you through uh, while Mike described why there is a need to be sustainable because there's a, a regulatory and compliance requirement to stick and there's a business opportunity because sustainability is more efficient and it attracts more customers in this uh, modern society where there is a degree of greenwashing. Everyone's speaking about uh, being sustainable, but in transparency, you can show that. Dave described many of the, the detailed data sources that need to be shared, where it, detailed information can be collected from a wide range of systems. And I want to talk about uh, this process here uh, using ASI framework. Uh, this is an approach to environmental sustainability to uh, increase efficiency by modifying behavior. And the first uh, simple objective is avoid, avoiding unnecessary journeys. Now, in personal travel, we can avoid traveling when we don't need to and use remote services like we are today. Uh, but there is a case that uh, there is a lot of wasted journeys in the transport and logistics industry, uh, because according to the data wing of the European Commission, Eurostat in 2020, 20% 20 of road freight transport in EU was empty, and in Ireland it was 34% empty. So between a the road freight is unused empty freight. So understanding your utilization of those assets can change that. Uh, the Paris process on mobility and climate says, if you were to make use of the spare vehicle capacity, we could cut UK carbon emissions by as much as 8%, uh, contributing to a more sustainable transport industry. And, and in the public sector, uh, in, in bus and rail and metro operators, and by understanding the capacity that you need to serve passenger freight, you can avoid wasted journeys. So avoiding is about understanding the need. Um, shift is about moving more towards energy efficient modes of transport. And uh, you know, uh, for those of you who are moving or adopting electric vehicles, you hear of range anxiety. Uh, people are wondering, can my electric vehicle take me the distance? Well, for the, the businesses we work on, they want to understand which of their vehicles are appropriate to move to uh, an, an EV. Uh, uh, um, and so they need to, the detailed analysis on that. And, and improve is about improving efficiency through better tracking all the detailed metrics and data that Dave uh, describes. So across the complete uh, gamut of transport, sustainability is delivered by sharing that data internally and externally. And uh, the areas we draw experience on from rail, for example, we are working with the railway operators like Northern Ireland Rail, looking at long term timetable planning and using passenger counting to accurately understand people movement and to plan that capacity and then to react to near term service optimization. With bus, you need to understand a common way is to look at the peak vehicle requirements. So we work with Ulster bus to monitor and report on when, uh, what vehicles are available, where and when, uh, and what are being serviced on. In, in the metro area, city centre transport, uh, uh, we work, for example, with TransLink, where they're introducing uh, the likes of tap-on tickets with the glider service to better understand consumer uh, behaviour, passenger movement, commuter profiles. I mean, a goal on a personal side is to get people into active travel, and that's about joining up mobility as a service. So you know when, when individuals can move from one mode of transport to another to complete their journey. Um, you know, in the, in the personal uh, uh, and commercial uh, light vehicles, um, you know, there is that uh, desire from fleet managers to understand the best time for replacing old vehicles and, and very often adopting here uh, greener 
modes of transport. And Dave covered off the uh, transport and logistics industry where, let's face it, rising fuel costs are a key commercial driver here. Um, uh, and by optimizing fuel use, you're reducing your emissions ultimately. Um, by understanding and addressing the driver shortages and the changing consumer habits, you can improve the utilization. So uh, when we look at data sharing, I consider it from three areas. There's the external data sources, as Dave described, fuel supplier data, vehicle tracking platforms, uh, accident and incident reports. There's internal data sharing, so you're gathering information on your servicing, your MOTs, repairs, PSVs. You have asset registers of your vehicles of types. You have departmental assignment, you know, who's using what vehicle in what areas at what time. And, and departmental budgets, this is a financially driven as much as an environmentally driven discussion. And on the public safe facing side, of course, the public sector, open data, making that available, supplying your other partners, compliance with CSRD. And I've kind of shown an infographic on, on a, you know, infographics for ESG reporting to your consumers and your customers because they value seeing that information and that needs to be gathered over time, collated um, for CSRD. It needs to be auditable. You know, so uh, the same way that businesses have learned to gather financial information and make sure it's traceable, the same needs to happen um, for CSRD data. And if I look at the avoid, so how do you avoid wasted journeys? Uh, and I'm going to look at a current customer of ours, TransLink, where we're working across bus, rail, metro. And the primary objective here was to understand the availability of vehicles, bus and rail to meet passenger demand. Uh, we were looking at service operations, looking at the engineering when those vehicles are on or off road um, and, and the operation centers for bus and rail. And, and then we're reporting peak vehicle uh, data by depot and area. And this, uh, the data sharing might described as the vertical view, so top down and bottom up. Executives might see a balanced scorecard to drive organizational targets, but they need to drill down to that detailed information. And there's horizontal data sharing across the organization's siloed systems. And then there's external data sharing on the incoming side from those third party suppliers. And, and uh, for TransLink, they had to report to their parent body, the Department for Infrastructure and their public service agreement. Are they meeting their obligations? And, and all of these have a cost and efficiency uh, and availability, a capacity, but these drive sustainability. So, you know, we present uh, views that allow these uh, summarized views on performance, uh, customer experience to be collated together. And if you look at some of the KPIs, uh, we will be reporting maybe 400 key performance indicators across all areas of uh, TransLink's business. But they're looking at that peak vehicle requirement, uh, and this will be broke to, broken down by the depot area by day. Are there six buses in this depot on this day to meet the expected demand? And then they're looking at miles lost. And miles lost when vehicles off or empty buses, these are all drivers of um, sustainability objectives. Because if you have spare vehicles unused uh, and looking at the zero emissions vehicles and the zero emissions uh, 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 buses. So uh, we help bring that information together from all disparate systems, uh, data sharing internally to be presented in an auditable manner and a reported manner. There's a shift. So you want to adopt electrical vehicles, uh, taking Northern Ireland Water as an example. They have um, a, an essential service delivered to the uh, citizens of Northern Ireland, 24-7 service, 365 days a year to all areas of Northern Ireland. 
and they rely on six to 700 light commercial vehicles and heavy goods vehicles to deliver these services. They know they understand, they understand that importance of decarbonizing their fleet. And so their customer and operations director says he needs an efficient, reliable fleet that's vital for their staff to deliver that essential services. So when they're looking at vehicle replacement, they want to see and uh, not just uh, we know uh, it's a good sustainable thing to move to electric vehicles, but deciding which vehicles uh, can be replaced uh, needs to look at the economic life cycle um, of each vehicle and vehicles by type and understand if there are nuances by the regions they serve. So we had to engage a lot of different stakeholders, finance, HR, drivers, heads of departments, fuel suppliers, and ultimately we were automating reporting to reduce these costs. And there's again that vertical uh, share, data sharing because management want a summary, but they need to drill down into row level detail. There's horizontal sharing because that HR and finance data has to be tied with the telematics information that they've described. And, and they're trying to what we call harmonize. So bring together a different um, similar concepts, a journey you know, uh, across these different uh, platforms and allow a per vehicle analysis and per vehicle type analysis. And so this results in a broad range of reports. And if we kind of look down through here, it's covering the areas that they've described on harsh braking and acceleration that impact the efficiency. But there's also uh, an economic life cycle analysis, and I'm, I'll come to that in a minute. So this performance analysis is, is the last place where you can improve in the uh, model of avoid, shift, improve. And this is seeing how you can drive better efficiency out of those vehicles and the system as a whole. Um, and an example here, we're going to look at economic life cycle analysis. So comparing uh, vehicle cost and value. And in this project, uh, it was very specifically to look at when is the time of, of vehicles replacement. Uh, and we're looking at the efficient vehicles by type and age. And so uh, this, if you can see it, is kind of showing the a breakdown by the vehicle types in cost, the functions that are using them. Uh, they're looking at fuel costs, service costs, the breakdown between heavy goods vehicles and uh, light commercial vehicles. Um, and, and they're looking at cost by function such that the different types of vehicles can be grouped together. And then I looked at, at a cost analysis because there's a time when, when you can um, understand the impact uh, to the bottom line um, as you're replacing those vehicles. And we take this economic life cycle analysis to explain it. Um, a vehicle, the, the uh, red line is the depreciation of uh, the vehicle value. So over time, the vehicle reduces as it gets older. Um, there's a repair cost, uh, the uh, SMR, service maintenance and repairs, that increases over time because they're inefficient vehicles and, and inefficient vehicles lead to more emissions. And so you combine that uh, to get a complete economic life cycle analysis and you can see the ratio repair to value. So for uh, this particular customer, they would have formally decided the best time to repair or the, the, in the absence of data uh, sharing, um, the time to replace that vehicle was at, at an annual interval. So five years or seven years for this vehicle type. But now a more detailed view informs the business function, the financial function that can make that business case because this is a commercial case for moving to sustainable transport as well as an environmental one. And, you know, um, to a, a big point that many of you uh, will ask, and this seems complex and everyone asks us, where do you start? Uh, and it starts with understanding 
the quality of the information that's available. So looking at a discovery against those third party systems, those telematics and fuel and tachographs, what information is available, how accurate is it? Uh, Dave described the real time nature or near real time nature by the time you've pulled it into your uh, common platforms. And then there are business functions, you know, the financial reporting that has its own cycle of freshness. And so we look at the resilience, the security. If you're going to share externally, you need to redact driver information, vehicle identification numbers. You want to ensure this information, if you're sharing it externally, cannot be de-identified. And we bring this through an iterative approach. Um, so we uh, ideate, we create ideas, we innovate with prototypes, we deliver these incremental reports. And you'll find that uh, our clients start one by one, safety, fuel efficiency, emissions, uh, overarching sustainability goals, capacity, um, route optimization, vehicle replacement. And this is a journey that uh, is common again and again. And, and it's unique to each business. The concepts are the same, but it's something that um, we help uh, companies with. And um, I'm going to uh, finish up by uh, reiterating that this is um, a, a, an environmental and a business decision. And if you need help getting started, I'd be more than happy to speak to you about it. So, uh, Mike, uh, I'll pass back and Absolutely. maybe if you want to I'll stop sharing here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you both, uh, David uh, and Colm. Thank you very much for that. And look, guys, also in the background, I know you've been answering the uh, some of the questions we've been putting out to you there. So I really appreciate that too. It's it's good to learn as well. You've been, uh, Colm, you've been addressing public sector an awful lot, and it it so happens there's an awful lot of public sector people joining today. I want to just we got some questions, and just before the questions, I just want to come back and wrap this really up a little bit because. I live in a world of threes. It, I find it very convenient, maybe for myself, is that there's really three things that I'd like you, if you all could take away today from this. Certainly something I've been taking away from this, from listening to David and Colm is, it's actionable today. You don't have to wait for what can I be doing? Look at what can be done today. It isn't just from us. There are things there today you can go out come to the events come and talk to other people as well but it's very actionable secondly esg or csrd if you're here in ireland and across europe its reporting is here today it's required but it's good for business don't see it as the stick please look at it as the carrot it's good for your business to act on today and finally i'm, I'm bound to say this but it, it is so true in every single business we talk about clear viable data is the key to good reporting which is good for your business which we've said is actionable today so take those three away if you could today but before we wrap up we've got a few minutes left uh, I thank you all for staying as well. I really appreciate that. I can see you all on there still. Uh, there are there's a question here. So just while you're thinking of some questions, you can all, you can just open up your line to ask a question. But I've got one here already. Uh, this may have been touched on, but I believe it could be for Colm. But it, it says, how is historic and near time sustainability data collated and reported? Is that okay, Colin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand. Uh, actually, it's a, it's a very good question because um, Dave spoke of the uh, surge of telemetry that's available to provide uh, that uh, real time and near real time data. The mobile apps, driver apps, are are adding into uh, a response that's uh, immediate uh, and faster than it has been on collecting information from drivers, and and internal business systems get updated. So so all information has a degree of freshness, and some of it is measured at the time uh, and. Uh, in the absence of a digital world, this was historic reporting. So we're shifting more. Uh, 
and and very often we have uh, degrees of management uh, in the team. So somebody is looking at information on a daily basis for an operational purpose. You know, they're dispatching in response to um, a sudden, uh, you know, snowstorm, uh, uh, leaves on the track, <laughs> um, uh, a bus strike. That's reactionary planning with information. Um, then there's those that are looking at the efficiency on a weekly basis at a management level. And sustainability goals are set in long-term strategies, your net zero objective, um, you know, your annual reports. Uh, and, and so the information that's collected from different systems needs to be recorded in time series mode and allow different um, different data consumers to see that at different times, because when you publish your ESG report, a very slick end of year summary, you know, that needs to be trusted, verifiable, auditable. Um, and, and so you, you're, you're viewing that all throughout the year in order to optimize it. Um, so hopefully that answers the question for whomever asked it. No, thank, thank, thanks very much. And actually, there was another question, but actually, Emma's very kindly transferred it into a question back to everyone, which was, "What is the biggest challenge your organisation faces?" And th that, so that that was the original question. But it's nice to hear from everybody as well. Something for everyone to think about: lack of data skills being the main answer back. Uh, which again, obviously, it, it does resonate into what we've been talking about today. But uh, also, trust in data quality. Something that we heard an, an awful lot about actually at the conference we were just at last week at AWS. Uh, it's very, very interesting to hear that one as well. So, so that was very good. I'd like to probably, always in the interest of keeping on time with these things, I would probably like to, we've got just probably about 90 seconds left. So whilst, again, you're still there, everybody. So I just wanted to say that we do have our next webinar, which is in May. It'll be give or take one month from today. And it's going to be very interestingly in how does AI work in the TNL market? And there's a lot of moving happening in this. Are there pros and are there cons? to how AI is going to assist going forward. So that's going to be a great one. So please uh, come and join us for that. We'll be at our next event. I know, David, you're already at an event today. So uh, you're already busy uh, as it happens. But our next event is next week. We'll be at Procurex, and again, knowing that there's a whole load of public sector on the call today, we may well get the chance to talk to you in person, which would be fantastic. So please stop by our booth in the SME section at uh, RDS next week, uh, Tuesday, I believe. We'll be there all day. And then finally, what's next is I'd love to say book a review with us. Come and talk to us. Come and talk to David at Simplicity Group. We're here for a conversation. It isn't all about selling you things. It's actually about learning us learning from you. So please book a review or come and talk to David and let's, you know, let's take what you need to the next stage. But otherwise, we've reached the top of the hour. David, Colm, uh, Emma and everyone that's come and joined us today. Thank you all very much. And as I say, the recording will be available to share with your colleagues straight afterwards. So. <laughs>